this retrospective on Delta Force is sponsored by, well, Delta Force. Delta Force Hawk Ops is a cross-platform, operator-based, tactical, multiplayer, online, first-person shooter game by Timmy Studio Group. The game combines various gameplay elements, including tactical operator action based on professional roles, PvPvE, survival and extraction, and large-scale player battles in open maps and battlegrounds, soon to be available on just about everything modern. The game wasn't ready for me to try by the time they approached me for this video, so they asked me if I was interested in doing a retrospective on the Delta Force series as a whole, at least the beginning all the way up through Black Hawk Down. And I thought, sure, that sounds fun. It's not a series that I'd usually try on my own, so this is a good excuse to try something new. Released in 1998 for Microsoft Windows and later re-released on Steam in 2009, Delta Force tried something relatively new at the time. It came out on my birthday! <coughs> nah, I'm just kidding. Well, okay, no, it did, but that's not what I... Hold on. Rather than these trendy run-and-gun arena sci-fi shooters that I happen to love so much, Delta Force was closer to a military simulation, loosely based on the US Special Ops unit of the, uh, not same name. Apparently Delta Force is not what they were officially called in real life, even though that's what they went by, but it was never trademarked, putting the developers Nova Logic in a really unique situation where they could just trademark this term. The goal was giving the players a realistic approach into combat and strategic options for their gameplay, kicking off the early days of the FPS military sim subgenre that would later flood the market in another decade or so. At its heart, Delta Force's appeal was its gameplay, putting the players in the boot of their operators and embarking on a series of operations across the globe. Whether it was eliminating hostile forces, assassinating high-profile targets, or doing everything you can to rescue a POW before you learn that they've been moved to a different tent. Alpha the King, there is no hostage. I repeat, no one home, no hostage. No Nova Logic probably didn't account for the modern uh, FPS approach of running and gunning at the same time though, so it's pretty easy to catch AI by surprise and give him a quick tap in the skull, but you die about as fast as they do. One minute you're living out a power fantasy, and then the next you're suddenly shot dead with no idea as to what happened. This would be a deal breaker in some other games, but because of how short these missions can be, it was almost addicting to get myself back into the action after I was shot down. Part of that though is thanks to the loadout options you're given before each mission. Yeah, going for that high-range sniper rifle sure sounds appealing for most missions, and it definitely is. But once you're out of ammo, what are you gonna do, start sniping them with your pistol? I mean, okay, you probably could do that, but you're better off using the semi-auto settings with these mid to long-range rifles for long distances. The arsenal was pretty impressive, and it's a lot more than just pointing and clicking, at least when it came to long-range, because bullets aren't hit-scan, they're actual projectiles that begin to drop off at a set speed and after a set distance, depending on the weapon. That's not to say that Delta Force 1 was perfect. Honestly, the single player was really just okay. But looking back at its reviews, it seems to be more widely regarded for its multiplayer, accommodating up to 32 players in joint co-op tactical operations, and a gaming experience that wasn't too common back then. Still, for the average Joe, modes like Deathmatches and Capture the Flag still had their heated 90s gamer moments, all presented in voxel graphic goodness courtesy of Kyle Freeman's voxel space engine, which was used in their previous series Comanche. Dude, I have no idea what I'm doing. How do I stop spinning? Oh, who's that? I wasn't able to upscale the game into modern resolutions, but I think that kind of worked because that little old school charm of playing this game in a low resolution engine really made me understand what people saw back then. If I saw this upscaled, it probably wouldn't look as good as it does here. Though I'm not sure what's up with the top of the screen there. That, yeah, that's not the recording. It just does that whenever I try to play. This is fixed if I try to run the game windowed, but then my mouse doesn't work and I don't want to use the arrow keys to aim. This problem did persist with Delta Force 2, but thankfully the game has plenty of other quality of life features that made it worth it. The map is more detailed and given its own dedicated square in your little HUD, so you don't have to sacrifice screen real estate just to look at where you're going. And now when it comes to gunplay, players need to factor in wind speed for their shots, becoming way more drastic at long distances. Missions across the whole Delta Force series really have you moving between waypoints that are set routes throughout these larger maps, and the sequel adds this orange dot onto the minimap, letting you see vaguely which direction you need to go just in case you happen to wander off, which in my case happened quite a bit because exploring these can be kind of fun. 
Especially here, since houses tend to have a lot more goodies in them. I didn't really see that a lot in the first game. The updated Voxel Space Engine 32 allowed for even more tense stealth sections, enhancing tactical choices with the inclusion of tall grass and other non-collidable models that the player can hide behind. The single player was more or less the same, but multiplayer added support for up to 50 players to join the same lobby, a trend that would be carried on by their next entry, Delta Force Land Warrior, which may not have been regarded as highly as the previous two entries, adding 30 missions that send the player across Africa and South America with meticulous planning before deployment, just like the other games, but did so in a more straightforward manner, not letting you decide which campaigns you want to do as sort of like worlds of levels, and putting it into more of a straightforward level-to-level -level campaign, pacing the player by having them deploy via parachute or helicopter. But that was about it. It didn't quite hit the same chord that the other two games did. And its expansion, Task Force Dagger, didn't fare all that much better, only really being noteworthy for what it added to the level editor, with missions developed by a completely different studio and really only being regarded for its map editor. But the series would finally hit the big time with their fourth entry, Delta Force Black Hawk Down. Yeah, this definitely feels closer to a modern video game. Is that Impact Font? All right, I'm gonna be using Impact Font for the rest of this video, thank you. Released on March 23, 2003 across not only PC, but modern consoles at the time, Black Hawk Down took players into a new era of Delta Force, taking notes from their previous PS1 exclusive spin-off, Delta Force Urban Warfare, which had a much larger focus on close quarters combat and surprisingly detailed faces for the PS1 that are incredibly uncanny. The game didn't run very well, but I do really miss that dancing loading screen icon. Just look at that little dude go. BHD set itself apart from the rest of the series, both thanks to this and by giving the player some more scripted sequences, helping the game feel more like a cinematic experience of a movie that uh, had a very similar name. Progression was still sort of linear, giving the player three missions that they could choose from, and with every mission they complete, another mission is added to that list until eventually they finish the game. Giving the series a single player that could finally rival its multiplayer, which still did pretty well here, co-op getting praise from even its worst reviews. The reception for Black Hawk Down was mixed, but still notable, earning a pretty large cult following that still seems to be alive today, judging by Steam reviews and YouTube comments anyway. Critics appreciated the shift into close quarters combat, and though classic fans still took note of the shift away from the series' tactical roots, some of that feeling could be slightly relived in its expansion packs, Team Saber. It didn't really have anything new in it, and had some pretty long scripted turret sections, which were my least favorite parts of BHD, but I'm not gonna say it was bad, and even the ability to change weapons midway through the level was pretty nice. I would've liked to seen this more in the base campaign. Maybe someday we could see these games remastered with proper modern system compatibility. That'd be pretty cool, I'd be happy to give that a shot. And from my research, that seems to be where the Delta Force series has peaked up until this point. There were later entries, like Extreme 1 and Extreme 2, but from what I can tell, those games had some development issues. And in the meantime, if you liked this sort of shorter format for videos, let me know because this was a little bit refreshing to do in between some of my larger projects, which are... Uh, but in the meantime, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you to the Delta Force team for sponsoring this video. Subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you guys soon. <laughs> Bye, guys.